and all the gathered guests, there's some members from my, uh, from my congregation, from the church where I serve here, and I'm glad that uh, you were able to come out uh, as well. We have a beloved mentor of mine, Mr. Adrian Backus, who's here today. Uh, I thank God for, for him and his presence. Uh, my mother is here, from Waco, Texas, and I'm being blessed by her. She's known me more, <laughs> and she's known me longer than any of us. <laughs> so, um, so again, I am uh, very pleased that she's here. My beloved, beautiful, brilliant wife is here. She's sitting in the rear. I told her to move up, but she's here. And uh, this is Allison, and we have been married, and we, this year will be 20 years. And so uh, I'm very thankful for her. She's a wonderful mother, a dear friend of mine, and uh, I thank God for her. We, um, when we arrived at uh, Howard, uh, my eldest was three, and now she has her learner's permit. <laughs> this is scary. Um, Olivia, would you stand and just be acknowledged? <laughs> Our middle child, Ella, she's here. Ella, would you stand? Ava, would you please stay <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you. This lecture is dedicated uh, to the memory of five African American preacher sages, representative of five different denominational traditions, and each of them has left an indelible mark on me as a politician. I will forever seek to honor them for their great contributions in the work that I do. Dr. James Earl Massey, 1930 to 2018, uh, representative of the Church of God. Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, 1950 to 2018, uh, PCUSA. Dr. James Howell Cone, 1938 to 2018, African Methodist Episcopal. And Dr. Edgar, Evans Edgar Crawford, 1923 to 2019, United Methodist Church. And finally, uh, Dr. Charles Edgar Booth, 1947 to 2019, who represents the Baptist tradition. Before I go any further, I wanted to acknowledge the presence of our associate provost, um, Dr. Okiata Dark. Uh, thank you for being here. She cannot stay the entire time, but I appreciate your presence. Before I begin, I want to invite the presence of Dean Crawford to this room, just to bless um, this space. And so to center us, I want to uh, play just a short clip that was also played at his home homegoing uh, service. I shall not live it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his dead sins. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They come from Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Will not my head before me. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. My whole life long. Amen. To quote one of my clergy colleagues, the Reverend Dr. Leslie Callahan of the St. Paul Baptist Church in Philadelphia, I give this lecture recognizing, and I quote, that the majority of Christians 
mainline Protestant, Catholic, and especially evangelical cast their ballots for a president whose rhetoric, conduct, history, and platform exemplify bigotry, which has undermined any sense that the faith that they practice and the God they worship bear any resemblance to mine. Callahan goes on to say, as committed as I am to my own faith as a Christian, and as much as I love Jesus Christ and the gospel, I have had many moments during which I question both publicly and privately whether any redeeming value could be found in the American Christian experiment. If Christians en masse could validate that guy, in 2016, then the bankruptcy of the American church as a moral and social institution has been determined. But then I remember that my own ancestors developed both a strategy and an institution for rejecting the very hypocrisy I was decrying in American Christianity, and that is the black church. I will address two distinct yet related issues in this lecture. First, the politics of homiletical pedagogy, how preaching is taught. And second, homiletical aesthetics, how preaching shapes listener perception and theological consciousness. Three questions foreground this lecture. How might African American clergy leaders specifically and preachers in general think more critically about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in a world that has imagined Jesus as a white male imperialist. And secondly, how might African American clergy free themselves from pedagogical practices of methodological imperialism and reclaim for themselves a culturally indigenous homiletical witness? Thirdly, how might a clearer theological understanding of eschatology and the kingdom of God, or reign of God, depose imperialistic readings of the Bible, bring social critique to the white evangelical movement, and refocus the preacher's homiletical imagination? Answering these very big questions exhaustively is impossible especially given my allotted time. <laughs> now, this is the longest presentation I've ever given. Children, this is longer than a sermon. And this is longer than a lecture that I've given to you. <laughs> the title of my lecture is Decolonizing the Homiletical Mind, Religious Hypocrisy and Cultural Invasion. The Decol Decolonized Preacher. Now to my first question, how might African American clergy leaders specifically and preachers in general think more critically about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in a world that has imagined Jesus as white, male, imperialism? The phrase decolonizing the homiletical mind suggests, first of all, on a practical level, that preachers take stock of their preaching life and honestly evaluate their own theological vision and reassessing their homiletical methods. In addressing this topic, what we ultimately want to know is how well does the preacher's hermeneutics, interpretive strategies, help the listening community answer its questions about freedom, human dignity, community, restoration, spiritual transformation, justice, and hope. To decolonize is to reset the imagination. Homiletical decolonization is tied to post-colonial criticism. Post-colonial criticism deconstructs Western imperial history, analyzing texts and practices with the intent to reveal the per pervasive and devastating impact of colonial exploitation and domination and what it has had on colonized societies around the globe. As I think about it in the homiletical context, to decolonize is to reset the preacher's theological vision, enabling her to see herself as a co-establisher of meaning, 
working in concert with a non-coercive, promise-bearing, interventionist God who is constantly at work forming and reforming community. Decolonizing the mind requires a both preacher and listening community, what my dearly departed friend and predecessor, Dr. Evans Crawford, called a rigorous spirituality, which is much deeper than method. Dean Crawford shares in his book, The Home Call and Response in African American Preaching, the nature of his ongoing debate with Dr. Howard Thurman, his decadal predecessor at Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. Dean Crawford wrote, Thurman always insisted that preaching could not be taught. As you can imagine, it is a claim to which I, as a teacher, possibly doubting my job security, <laughs> vigorously objected. Although my primary academic credentials were in social ethics, I still felt that his claim was too sweeping. I came to realize, however, that his doubt was not whether preaching could be taught at all. Instead, Thurman was skeptical that it could be taught in any purely systematic way that ignored basic and fundamental spirituality. In light of the mystical dimensions of Thurman's contemplative, confrontative, dialectical style of preaching, in which he used an alternating pattern of pause and speech, to give witness to the living presence of the Holy One at work on the minds and hearts of the gathered community. What lay behind Thurman's skepticism was his belief that any effectual approach to preaching in style and substance should be anchored in deep spirituality, not the principles of homiletics as a pastoral art and academic discipline. This need for a deep spirituality brings us up against the question of pedagogy for preaching. I do not know if I have ever taught preaching, and this is a curious thing for a homiletician <laughs> to say, but the truth of the matter is that my work on specific issues, or in a specific sense, is facilitated. The work of mediating spirit-driven praxis-related exposures that assist learners in finding their unique and authentic voice as proclaimers of the gospel. What I can say without fear of contradiction is that the gospel with or without involvement is inherently effective. Beyond my human efforts, I know that teachers and preachers can make no claims to inherent effectiveness. True effectiveness is doing something with the anointing that blesses and ordains the preacher and teacher's work. Effective preachers hear the voice of God calling them into authentic expression to give clear interpretation of Jesus' healing vision of proclaiming release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and emancipation for the oppressed ones. As Prince of Peach uh, preaches, the late Dr. Charles Booth once declared, preachers have an awesome task. We dare to stand before people very much mindful of our weaknesses. Yet in the midst of our ever evolving and becoming selves, we are charged with the responsibility of proclaiming an everlasting and immutable gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a responsibility. In one sense, the preacher's homiletical task centers on gathering artifacts and relevant concerns and specific events in a particular congregation's life story and setting them in a larger drama of God's active presence in the world. But in another sense, the preacher's homiletical task centers on interpreting that which is gathered. The preacher who would profit the people is the preacher whose interpretive and proclamatory Posture is formed by her or his radical embrace of what homiletician Alice McKenzie describes as a sapiential hermeneutic, an interpretive strategy that honors the consecrated preacher and the waiting congregational congregation's antiphonal, egalitarian, and mutually enriching relationship. 
It has the same title on both preacher and congregation. And that title is Sage. So to answer my first question, a rigorous spirituality is fundamental to decolonized preaching. Decolonized preaching is sagely work that requires thinking homiletically through a coalitional framework that lifts and values the sacred. The sagely dimension of preaching is wisdom-directed and communal. It is consonant with the African Jolly's principal task of, as poet and repository of the community's oral tradition. In song and storytelling and social political action, the Jolly and Grio would collect the wisdom and determine and remind the people how it functioned historically as the people were carriers of culture. Sagely preaching is spiritual and communally democratic. When the gentrifiers arrive at the doors of the black church and say, we want to build a new stadium right here, or we want to build a single unit loss for young urban professionals on the land flanking your church, or we want to partner with ossifying membership dwindled congregations and erect a senior complex or community center. To the listening congregation, the sagely preacher poses questions such as, where do we go from here based on who we say we are religiously? And how must we in community express our commitment to God through song and symbol. The preacher as sage is entrusted with the congregation's faith identity. In the act of proclamation, the preacher sage reminds the believers of their commitment as redeemed persons who have declared allegiance to the crucified and risen sage, Jesus Christ. The preacher's preaching in this mode is not an exercise of self-adulation rhetorical exchanges such as you missed your shout <laughs> or applauding oneself in the preaching moment having a monologue self-referentially with myself with the words preach Pastor Kenyatta. <laughs> Sagely decolonized preaching is not individualistic and personality driven. It's democratic, antiphonal, communal, engaging, inviting, and non coercive. And at bottom entails an ongoing moral commitment to kingdom ethics on the part of the preacher and congregation. In the empire of God, Jesus welcomes persons into personal relationship and fellowship, not coercively, but by invitation. Still, preachers remain unthoughtful about how certain interpretations and uses of the New Testament in the interest of religious expansionism actually prop up imperialism. The consequence of preachers deploying imperialistic conversion tactics is that fear-based listeners and kingdom ethics and true discipleship take a back seat. Anti-colonial readings such as Mark 10 Whoever does not accept the empire of God as a little child will not enter it, Mark 10 and 5 of the New Testament, function to subvert the status quo. But those unwilling to share part are part with wealth, face an even more insurmountable challenge. This runs counter to much of what is heard about the English speaking, gun blessing, Nordic martyr who became white. Hmm. J. Cameron Carter's intriguing discussion in his book, Race, a Theological Account, details the theological processes of how Christ was abstracted from Jesus' Jewish roots and became effectively a white racialized figure. And thereby launching modernity's intellectual and social processes that ultimately recast Jesus, Jesus' Jewish covenantal flesh, for Jesus' Jewish racial flesh. 
What he helpfully unpacks is the discursive path upon which theology embarked to legitimate a modern racial imaginary, inimical to Afro-Christian faith, and thus has thrown postmoderns into a theological crisis that forces one to question the future direction of theology. Now, based on this observation, one could readily see how Howard Thurman could rightly assert that Jesus of Nazareth is the most dangerous figure on the horizon of mortal human beings. And this is why we wonder why this so-called Christian civilization doesn't bother with Jesus. The tendency to domesticate Jesus for our political purposes stands in contradiction stands in contradiction to the radical and dangerous message Jesus proclaimed. To truly follow Jesus and be discipled by him involves counting the exacting cost of following one whose message and agenda was to dethrone worldly powers and make new life possible for humanity, especially the culturally despised, politically oppressed, and social dispossessed who, in the words of Howard Thurman, lived with their backs against the wall. The decolonized teacher. Now, this is a larger project, but I, I want to highlight just a few observations here relative to the pedagogical, or pedagogical, aesthetical, or hermeneutical, and praxeological elements <laughs> of decolonized preaching. So that question, if you remember, is how might African-American clergy themselves from pedagogical practices of methodological imperialism and reclaim for themselves a culturally indigenous homiletical witness. Homiletical pedagogy. Preachers construct identity and encode experience in living community. Whether the preacher comes to her community carrying fruit modern views about the validity of the Bible and Christian doctrine, or filters his experience in deference to the imperial gods of logic and science, peeling away the husk of credulity to appease the modern mind, or ushers in deconstructive tools to decenter modernism's reliance on the empirical formula, scrutinizing the data to see if its theological posture honors inclusivity, pluralism, and diversity. The preacher's words never escape the social context which shaped them. Despite this, across the lines of race, ethnicity, culture, homiletical proposals have in general accepted being one size fits all homiletical methods, having specific assumptions for preaching, specifically the commitment to embracing claims to knowledge in some fundamental servitude. Only recently have contemporary textbooks emerged that are purposely designed to speak to a religiously fragmented, culturally pluralistic world. And as a consequence, such a reality has had detrimental effects for preaching birth in socially marginalized communities. Now, the focus of my work in homiletics is intentionally context specific and at the same time intentionally transgressive in terms of thinking about finding ways to invite all human beings to name their own story reality and common share in the larger society. In a practical sense, Asian and Asian Americans, Latinos and Latinas, and womanists, for example, have found resonances in their own homiletical consciousness in the narrative I construct, because identity construction, geographical place, and perceptions of hope can mean different things from one community to another. Now, it is important that we do, we, we tell our own stories. This is not to negate the importance of fostering ecumenicity and Christian unity, but rather is an expansive view to helping uh, listeners to preach seeing Jesus themselves or seeing themselves as communally shaped beings having to share as co-participants with God. 
in bringing about a just society where all people are viewed as having equal worth in God's economy. So as an African American theorist in the discipline of practical theology, I come to my work at best suspicious and at worst alarmed when scholars refuse to acknowledge theological blind spots or scrutinize pedagogical practices and ethnocentric biases. Hermeneutical strategies for preaching have failed to admit that theological points of view are privileged or disregarded based on social location are intellectually dishonest and ultimately will not hold up its end of the deal in a context of religious threat and theological insecurity. Although sustained academic reflection on preaching, on black preaching that is, began in earnest in 1970 with the release of Dr. Henry Mitchell's Black Preaching, The Recovery of a Powerful Art. One, for example, can pick up the most widely used and celebrated textbooks on preaching today. Haddon Robinson's Biblical Preaching, now in its third edition. John MacArthur's Preaching, How to Preach Biblically. Thomas G. Long's The Witness of Preaching, now in its second edition. Fred Craddock's book Preaching, which was a game changer in homiletic theory, republished its 25th anniversary edition, and that's now available. And some texts written by persons who are black and cite no black preaching theorists. <laughs> it will work. And when Henry Mitchell's work is cited, it is often tokenized and reduced to a footnote. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not the case with my dear friend, Dr. Bruce Salmon, who's worked on storytelling preaching. He's a homiletician as well. Uh, acknowledged back in 1988 and brought in for us the work of Henry Mitchell. But overall, in general, this is the nature and consequence of homiletical whiteness. Robinson, MacArthur, Long, Craddock, White, Male, Protestant, Evangelical, Reformed, and Disciples of Christ, respectively. But more distressing on the pedagogical side of things is that one can now earn a Master of Divinity degree at certain theological institutions where taking a preaching course is optional. Wow. Now, why does this matter? Because colonizing homiletics consciously and unconsciously suggests to listeners and preachers that there is only one way to interpret the text, one authentic manner or style conduct conducive for constructing a sermon, one basis for preaching sermons, and that is to save souls, one ideal approach for delivering a sermon performatively. Now, whether the works are religiously conservative, moderate, or even liberal in orientation, theological seminaries and divinity schools often become principal players in domesticating the student preaching voice. As a child of the South who migrated northeast to seminary, I know the domestication process firsthand. Having attended Princeton, predominantly Euro American seminary, where reformed theological points of view are privileged, I quickly learned that doing well in preaching class carried with it the expectation that I would conform to and cope with a particular set of homiletical norms without having space to question their presuppositions or authority. My criticism here has less to do with the seminarian's need for theological stretching, but rather more to do with resisting racializing pedagogy and theologically relativizing practices that discipline learners to see the world through European eyes, thus establishing whites as global tutors. If a homiletics instructor has not frequently visited or preached in ecclesial context dissimilar from her or his own, then he or she has restricted her or his homiletical vision and moral authority to share wisdom. Now, because persons 
to the public early on, I taught to read life racially. That is to define myself culturally and racially against unrelenting patterns of comparison and false perceptions of white privilege birthed in colonialism, as theologian Willie Jennings maintains. Preachers of color have to be especially vigilant and theologically alert to the way socially dominant and culturally privileged westernized communities inject imperialism, commodify cultural work, and bound blackness and the production of its aesthetic values to the schemes and performances of whiteness. Now, recognizing this aesthetic struggle as a cultural predicament is important. To have a clear understanding of the theological challenge of seeing Jesus rightly as one who renders individuals capable of reframing their own visual ecology, to see themselves as God's beautiful ones in a society fragmented is crucial for preaching. If the preacher does not name the racial aesthetic regime in theological practice a theological failure, then the people who listen to that preacher will have a malformed picture of their right to human dignity and God-confirmed identity. Now, nowhere else is the devaluing and disruption of peoplehood in culturally determined ecosystems more evident than in the production, wide distribution, and heedless consumption of evangelism materials and methods used to indoctrinate and catechize members of culturally marginalized and socially disempowered groups. Now, the early missionary movements in the colonies, such as the Church of England Society for the Propagation of the Gospel to the Heathen in the Foreign Parts in 1701, sought to convert Africans without altering the enslaved African social position. As indicated in the Disciple of Christ homiletical methods and conversion strategies of American evangelical and fostered many modernist mission movements in underdeveloped countries, proselytizing campaigns have primarily focused on clothing, absent providing practical tools for equipping converts to be justice fighters against human exploitation in their context. Now this is why global evangelism without prophetic core commitments is gospel deficient and more socially regressive than politically liberative. Now finally, let's turn to our last question. How might a clearer theological understanding of eschatology and the kingdom of God depose imperialistic readings of the Bible, the decolonized church? How might it work news? Christian beliefs and practices declared normative today, though taken for granted, do not rise out of thin air, but are culturally conditioned. The Christian religious movements that have become mainstream in American society trace their heritage from Western theocultural beliefs and practices that are historically conditioned. The 16th century Protestant Reformation began in Europe not in Africa. The reason this is, in, is not insignificant is because the brand of Christianity in, introduced to enslaved Africans assumed a void in the theological and moral content of West African religious traditions and ontological systems. All theology is local and provisional. That is to say, they help us to see God, but to use the words of the late James Cone, all theologies are born to die. Mm -hmm. A sensitiveness to the experimental quality and profound symbols of the African sacred cosmology was never figured into the works of Martin Luther, John Calvin, Hubert Zwingli, or the theological concepts popularized by their pre-Reformation Roman Catholic forebears, Thomas Aquinas, John Wycliffe, and Peter Waldo. Now, in the same way, the cultural provenance of foundational Christian thinkers such as Augustine of Hippo, Origen, and Athanasius in the early church shaped their theological question sets 
and influence their theological visions. They also shape the sacred imaginings of continental theologians, Karl Barth and Paul Tillich in the post-World War milieu. So as tradition-bearing individuals constructing identity in communities, reading and interpreting scripture to address life's ultimate concerns, we who preach the gospel must acknowledge that with God, on whose behalf we speak, there is a double relativity. Our interpretations are relative to that is conditioned by the presuppositions we bring with us. And those presuppositions as humans, all too human, are themselves relative, penultimate, revisable, and even replaceable, and not absolute. Vision restricted eschatology. Now, this is why one's perspective on eschatology is crucial. According to philosophical theologian Frederick Ware, <laughs> the development of conceptions, articulations of identities or ideas, and critique of ideas about human destiny for African American theologians center on eschatology. Whether the conceptions, contributions of a glorious black past, the American dream, beloved community, the millennium, or the second coming of Jesus Christ, these concepts, claims with function to offer black people hope. A way of thinking about their world and the world to come, not as a utopian fiction, but as a divine promise made in the present and enacted in both the present and future on their behalf. As evident in the spirituals enslaved Africans guided by conscience and desire for freedom fashion, a biblical hermeneutic derived from literal and figurative interpretations of texts surrounding Christ's return and establishment of God's kingdom on earth. Since the Bible, hope, moral behavior, and history are key theological sources for Christians, where asserts, and because the kingdom of God is bold and norm, black eschatology is suspicious of the arrogance and triumphalism of American millennialism. For this reason, and to esteem past experiences, African Americans created their own black millennialism, which affirmed the notion that the pretty prudent use of what American culture has to offer and working within its social institutions could have socially transformative effect. That American society and Western civilization stands to face divine judgment for its sins. And that initiating a new age of equality and justice and peace will be the church's chief responsibility and work. Now, because the Christian religion has thrived largely through cultural myth-making, and from political battles fought in closed quarters. The global challenge today is not to get all Christian communities to sit under the same canopy of religious experience by universalizing or socializing individuals to a white global standard. Rather, the 21st century challenge is to call communities established in Christ's name to name and conscientiously embrace their equal share in Jesus' beloved and holy vision. Now, evangelicalism and social criticism. The label evangelical can mean a host of things, religiously and politically. The term itself has become politically corrupted and has ballooned into a great source of consternation within and without the body of Christ. Its long-standing usage derived from the Greek eongelion, meaning good news or gospel, and traces from Mark 1 and 1. However, as a term used in reference to a specific theology movement birthed in the European Reformation that arose in the late 19th and 20th century, evangelical fundamentalists huddled in reaction against liberal theology's claim that the Bible contained historically inaccurate elements that were disobliging to the modern mind. And hence, needed to be provable in order to be deemed reliable. 
since God was going to bring tribulation and destruction anyway, <laughs> at any moment. And so the basic goal is to get people saved and heaven bound. Ironically, adherents of this theology seemingly welcomed the worst, for that meant Christ would return sooner. With the election of Southern Baptist Sunday School teacher Jimmy Carter as U.S. President, who spoke evangelical speak as leader of the free world, who the religious right later disowned, the corporate style evangelism crusades of Billy Graham, the election of Ronald Reagan and George Bush, both of whom Graham had direct access, the expansion of Christian networks, radio networks, the plethora of books by James Dobson, the head of Focus on the Family, the rise of televangelists Pat Robertson, Jimmy Swagger, Jim and Tammy Baker of PTL, John Hagee, Chuck Swindoll in the 80s, the wildly popular Tim Hayes' or La Hayes' Left Behind series in the 90s, the rapid proliferation of prosperity-driven, non-denominational megachurches, the recruitment campaigns and substantial endowments to private colleges and universities like Liberty University, Bob Jones University, Regent University, and seminaries like Fuller in Pasadena, Southern in Louisville, Southwestern in Dallas, and Dallas Theological, a school birthed out of the vision of dispensationalism, or rapture theologians. And of course, with John MacArthur's towering corpus of books, America's white evangelical past has emerged from their marginalized subculture and become more politically engaged, forming religiously sectarian schools, primarily to preserve whiteness, as the potential for race mixing in public schools was too high of a risk. Endorsing and lobbying certain politicians and voting blocs to influence, frequently under the pretense of divine sanction, yes, one can point to an improved society in several ways. The spectacle of countless black lynchings where bodies, body parts were dismembered and collected as mementos on Sunday afternoon when white so-called Christians left their worship service to either participate, look on, or excuse themselves from the scene while cheery mobs committed heinous acts and met with impunity. Now this is no longer happening except young black men and women are getting shot, Michael, <laughs> the Color of Compromise, a book written by Jamar Tisby argues, one should not be surprised that the, that the Black Lives Matter movement is now singularly spotlighting the killing of black bodies today. T Tisby contends that while we may see changing systems, there remains a consistent narrative, a narrative constructed on the preservation of whiteness, on racism white supremacist ideology, and violence. Now, religiously, the battle lines in the sand are as conspicuous as ever, along with the flurry of theological contradiction. And this is why you see the election of Donald Trump. And while I have painted proponents of white evangelical theology in broad brush, which in the long view ignores some of the important historical nuances and ideological differences within the camp. Too many to discuss in this lecture. The point I'm making is that black evangelicals have far too uncritically imbibed much of these materials without taking time to understand their theological origins, agenda, and the underlying subtext they promote in preserving whiteness, imperialism, colonial power, and white settler cultural consciousness. Now, none of these communities that I have mentioned have a thoroughgoing theological critique of unregulated capitalism, mm -hmm. which has exploited the poor and ravaged the hurting. Mm -hmm. 
How you see your Bible will dictate your politics. Right belief without morally right actions to follow equals retarded faith. <laughs> now we know that Jesus preached and that he came teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. But we don't know how. That is, the manner in which he or John or Paul, for that matter, preached. Now we know he didn't preach in a tall steeple church or a mega church. And so still the recitation in Isaiah 64 in the Capernaum Synagogue, the Sermon on the Mount outlining the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, Peter's Sermon at Pentecost, the Exodus narrative, the prophets, often skipped over to jump to Calvary, <coughs> the tomb, and the apocalypse, which has been the dominant focus and the ground floor for evangelical theology, or piety, taken together, all of these form a robust picture of Jesus. And Jesus' love and compassion orientation toward humanity. Now, a decolonized hermeneutic for preaching the kingdom of God holds together in a Trinitarian pattern the living, lamentation, and celebration of the faith. A decolonized church community will take great pains to honestly evaluate the church's theological vision and methods for mission and evangelism, and see if it aligns with Jesus' inaugural vision to bring good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, and letting the oppressed go free. This means, for example, that the congregational community will tie together soul winning, discipling for Christ commitment, with practical tools for equipping converts to be justice fighters against human exploitation in their context. Now, what does this look like in a very basic and practical sense for pastors? One way to think about reorienting one's homiletical approach might mean setting up round tables to discuss the community's pressing needs and how a particular community perceives its leaders. To stir the pot a bit in this regard because preaching tends to be so apologetics driven, that is, defending the Christian faith in response to some misunderstanding or attack. Preachers of every theological stripe, conservative, evangelical, liberal, post-liberal, might consider, especially in a climate of so many religiously disaffected people, collaborating with the diverse communities in a post-apologetic manner. This means not being so wedded to an all or nothing apologetic method. Because the chief aim of apologetics is to seek to either disprove one's claims or retreat from authentic dialogue with the wider culture. Now, finally, the mind of Christ. What we do as preachers, what we do in the pulpit, and out in the world is theology. And theology in the broadest sense is speaking of a promise-bearing God who redeems and speaks to the real needs of real people. Because theology is practiced in community and public, part of that particular community story ought to be in the preacher's witness. This is why black preachers must free themselves from colonizers' corrupted vision of preaching and know that a robust spirituality is fundamental if preaching is to speak to the listener's lived experience in existential situation. In respect to who Jesus is, and what he came to do, it is not enough to speak about redemption in an objective sense that leaves us in the world of the biblical text to speak about the cross of Christ truthfully and persuasively is to be drawn into his image of vulnerability and come face to face with the God undergoing death to defeat all that is dead. Preaching about the cross in a decolonized way is a twofold task that is both critical and constructive. The first task is to clear away false understanding, and the second is to help congregation find faithful ways of reimagining redemption. In resetting the homiletical mind, 
The preacher, teacher of preacher, listeners of preacher, must be attentive to methods that mask deceit and religious hypocrisy, and must name explicitly identity bleaching, culturally invasive narratives, and practices that enslave the psyche and distort human consciousness. The hermeneutical homilist must take care to scrutinize methods of her or his homiletical program, for one's own approach may well be the seat of idolatry. If the expressed content of the preacher's message renders Christ fully present as word of God and is tied to what he came to do, it must be stated that the ground floor, or better, the gen gen genesis and terminus of our proclamation is God. It follows then that to truly have the mind of Christ is to know that homiletical, methodological, imperialism must be challenged at all costs. Thank you. seen some things over the last eight years um, that is called a considered effort of new church development. And a lot of people who are starting churches and they're starting in communities that they're normally weren't into. It's just like the, we used to have corner stores and that changed. And then it's a, a movement that I've heard with young evangelists who are going into communities um, where a faith community that represent uh, people like me. And there's an economic component to it because the mother church is doing this and young ones are going out and they're telling them how the gospel should be integrated and spread a certain way. So there's a resource movement going on. So if I, one of the things that I, I knew at Princeton by knowing the library was that we had an area called special collections. And see, a lot of our knowledge and how we free ourselves has a lot to do with access. And in that particular special collection, I remember very clearly when I did my research, I had a hard time getting those dusty books. There were a lot of catechisms that were written during slavery, and there was language that was used to maintain the slave for economic reasons, even in baptism. I don't know whether it's looked like, but part of my research was pulling those pieces out. That's why people didn't want to see it. And the reason I say that is because when you say how you see your Bible will dictate your politics, the question I ask you is, how do you use your Bible? Will it dictate your economics? And that's really critical, I think, in my community, uh, because you did touch slightly in America on the issue of capitalism. And I have, you know me, I have the terminal problem of believing, as I told Dr. West, that we once, having gone to Howard's Law School, we once were like my glasses, a thing in race, our ES, not our ATB, jurisdiction, we're property, pieces of property like this wood. And the question for me is how do I socialize this piece of wood into humanity? Because that dictates a lot of me and my values of who I am, and also it will be what people think of me or who they think they may need to become. So 
I'm really concerned about the economic at the SAGE component for the young people that we have, particularly in America, where the gap is getting wider to push things back 50 years, okay, for a reason economically. How does the church approach that in its communities where there's a greater need than ever for resources? And how does that dictate in a language of evangelism? Because I'm seeing it being covered over and we're running into some serious problems because people are moving us back into being an idol, not an element of humanity. And that concerns me. How do you approach the issue of the use of the Bible in the sense of the capitalistic approach in a purely capitalistic country like America? Do you see any stage aspect of that for the church in terms of a voice for young people who are studying theology? I certainly see possibilities in law as well as the embed that I have as a legal degree, and I don't hear the voice, and I'm not hearing it from the church, where people are critically in need of resources yeah. to survive. What's the church yeah. message? So I think, I think, first of all, thank you. Thank you for uh, commentary and, and the questions you're raising. Uh, I think, first of all, we have to reimagine what it means to be uh, part of the kingdom of God. And to think more critically, about our posture. Most African American Christians are biblicists and not so much uh, theological thinkers in the sense of, of asking oneself the question, how uh, does my work align with the, the message of Jesus? What Jesus came to do. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to do these, this thing, this thing, and this thing. But if our Bible is so much, if we worship the Bible and not the God of the Bible, mm -hmm. then we become, we, we work against the, the spirit of Christ, right? And so what we, what we deem anointing is it should, it should align us with what Jesus came to do, right? And so uh, whether... Sometimes that means that the church has to read against text. Now that seems like it's irreverent right. to read against the text, but when one reads or wrestles with the text, like uh, Jewish people with the Midrash, they're, they're actually interrogating it so that it can speak a new word. And I think that that's what, when you think about Jesus as the rabbi, the teacher, we have the model sage. And so if we're, not, if we're not functioning in that way, then I think we're missing a great opportunity spiritually and materially to reach the next generation. So I think, uh, again, and you know, I, tried to, I tried to address it in the lecture, a sagely preacher will gather up the artifacts of a local congregation, sacred memory, symbol, song, all of these things that um, that give description or definition or rooting in um, the witness of Christ. If, 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 if that is the case, then we need to be more collaborative and less individualistic in this American society. But that's very difficult to do because we weren't raised that way. So it's reading against, it's moving against some of that which we've, we've imbibed. Should that also be the position of listeners of preaching? If preaching is shaping theology, then should uh, people who are listening to this, should they begin to question, uh, at least question or challenge or be critical of that which they are being preached, or the recipients of being, of, uh, recipients of the preached word, right. and particularly in a religious context where communally, Black people are taught not to question the sage. Right. Preacher has high authority. Right. But how, so my question is, how do, how do you see black churches being able to practice theology in a, in a cultural norm 
where the preacher is not questioning. Mm. Excellent observation and question. Um, no, I, I, I think once the message is, is seen that folks don't have to go to church, that church is a voluntary organization, and that if preachers and pastors are not listening to the people who populate the pews, then, then the church is in, in trouble. You know, you're, you're going to either retreat or you're going to find a way to uh, reimagine or reshift the way in which you do ministry. Or, or not, you calcify or you die. That's the, those are the only options. Now, um, I think it's important that we allow voices from the margin to speak to the power structure, but that takes a lot of work. And that's why, um, that's why I think we have to work in a coalitional framework in order to get some of the things that we see as problematic predicaments to get them uh, resolved or at least addressed. Um, and so I, I, I empathize because I know you are a young minister in training and you will perhaps pastor a church someday, but you're probably still carrying the, the, the suit bag and the, and the briefcase of the senior pastor. And there is some benefit in that apprenticeship model, but that's, but to some degree we have to we have to start thinking about the next emerging voice mm -hmm. and not cripple them um, from an opportunity to actually rise and to do uh, to do work beyond um, what one's teacher has done. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
And as I mentioned at the very beginning, the decolonized preacher is spiritually grounded. There's not a class, you can ask my students, there's not a class that I start without praying. But I just think it's important, it's fundamental to teaching. So, so, so that's, that, I mean, long and short, you know, this is not anti-white, this is not anti-anybody, except those forces that work against uh, this beloved community that I think we're all trying to So I guess my question is, um, when um, I guess this whole notion of decolonizing the whole of mind, and I'm thinking of the black church, and that if you preach a gospel of liberation, um, and you move out of queer theology, um, then you lose income, you lose people, people don't have the tendency to connect or feel a reason to connect to the church. And as a queer pastor of an affirming church that's preaching liberation, there's that draw to for people to come without the fear that of the dispensation list and you know all that. So so I'm wondering with the decolonization, is it also kind of deconstructing uh, the church completely and and removing from what we know to something completely different um, and the fear of those who see liberation, but realizing liberation also means what we have is what well, no longer be. Right, no, that's, that's an excellent question. I, um, again, I think colonies are settling. They're, they're, they, they set up and they grow by setting up. Now, Jesus didn't, wasn't a pastor in a church, right? <laughs> His ministry was on the move. And so if that is the case, then that's the model. That's, I mean, that at least that's the model. Um, and so, yes, it's a pra pra from a pragmatic, practical concern. Yes, we want people to give to the church to support the ministry. But when they don't, again, we have to believe in faith that somehow God is going to support the ministry that God has called us to. You know, and I mean, you know, I don't think Jesus was. Rich. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, we're in America. And so, you know, I'm the last person that wants to be poor. But I, what I realize, though, is the more that I die to who I am, the, 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 the more expansive is my vision for God's people. Now, church is hurt. People are hurting. And that's why people are, that's why they go to the church. And, and, and so the pastor's role is, I think, extremely critical to not only intercede for the people, but also to, to be Christ, to be the presence of Christ among the believers. That, and, and hurting people and people to shepherd them so that they can find some sense of liberation. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, the bargain. If we're not esteeming the human dignity of people, seeing people as people of God, then you know that's that's on us. We don't have to give an account. <laughs> and you know, every, nobody gets a pass. I don't care what your orientation is. Nobody gets a pass on this life. I hate to bring this to a close, um, but I, I'm the timekeeper um, officially for the whole entire school. <laughs>